Welcome to Morningside After Dark. I'm so happy to have you. We still see a couple little seats here and there in the front if people need seats. We are so honored to have you on this crappy night that you would come in from the cold and join us for moving pictures. Get your popcorn ready. It's going to be an amazing night. I'm your, one of your hosts, Rebecca Sorensen. We've got Katie Byrne in here and Jim Mahoney. We're thrilled to be your co-hosts. We want to um, thank the Morningside Theatre Company and director Ella Williams for accommodating us tonight. Uh, they're in the middle of rehearsals for Mary Poppins. You're going to see a little more of that at some point tonight. But uh, we're also just so gra grateful for anyone who wants to watch this later or share with friends. We have a Dyna TV here. Chris Laskowski is our videographer. He's doing a fabulous job back there. Thank you so much, Chris. And you might see our friend Kathy Tower over here taking photos so we can document tonight. Thank you so much, Kathy. Just flew in from LA to be with us, so we're so grateful she's here. She's from here. No, that, that sounded way more fancy. Um, we want to thank our sound engineers, John Robinson, George Scott McKelvey, for making this show sound so good. And we have our stage manager, David Bilgen. Come on out, David. David is also a phenomenal backstage photographer and a real life photographer with his work for sale. We promoted that a bit on our Facebook page, but please go check his table out after the show. He's got some incredible, iconic photos of the Twin Cities. Um, Mary Engelke, where are you? Thank you for being our house manager with your sidekick, Doug. And for all of the Morningside Linden Hills volunteers who make this possible for us and let us come in here and do this. Um, I really want to introduce now uh, Pastor Obi Ballinger with the Dinah Morningside Linden Hills Community Church for welcoming us and being a, such a lovely host for us. Thank you, Obi. Good evening. Lights, camera, action. Welcome to the scene, a world of moving pictures. Oh, so keen. Where stories come alive, then songs take flight, and images dance before our very sight. It's not so different from above, <laughs> where souls are raised in worship, prayers, and love. Here, here let bells ring out with joyful sound, for two churches have merged and now are bound. Edina Morningside and Linden Hills, united in purpose, hope, and God wills, in faith, in love, and in community, creating a new church in unity. Now, in March, Mary Poppins comes to town. Morningside Theater will bring the house down, or <laughs> up. Hurry, get your tickets. Don't delay, for they're selling fast. Don't miss the play. And if you're looking for a preschool that's grand, at Morningside, we'll think you'll understand. The joy and wonder that our children feel when they learn, play, and grow with zeal. So, let us enter into this world of art and let the moving pictures do their part. But if you want to speak in Shakespeare's style, iambic pentameters worth your while. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Mahoney. Thank you. Thank you for our, uh, to our longtime patron, Yoga Fit Linden Hills, for their continued support. <laughs> Located at 50th, uh, 45th in France, they live up to their mission to make yoga and fitness accessible to everyone. Yoga Fit is here tonight signing up all new guests for free yoga through March 15th, and you can meet Ashuk at uh, the main uh, door here after the show if you'd like. Welcome to our community sponsor, Kama a new bookshop in Linden Hills. Thank you. Incredible space. They have a pop-up tonight featuring new releases and selections from our authors who will be signing copies of their work after the show. And there are also books on the theme of moving pictures. The proprietor of Comma, Victoria Ford, has good reason not to be here tonight as tomorrow night she will be a contestant on Jeopardy. Whoa. Pretty good, pretty good. Tell you what, talented neighborhood. We have an exciting new sponsor, Ready in Rome, a local travel company specializing in multi-generational travel to complex destinations. They are popping up at tonight's event with a chance to win a custom trip planning service for your desperately needed escape from winter. A winner will be drawn at the end of the show, so stick around. 
We want to give a special thanks to our nonprofit partner, Dissonance, bringing the arts to support mental health services uh, to create a healthier world. Find out more at their sponsor table. Jeremiah is here tonight. And, uh, or you can visit uh, their website at dissonance.website. Thank you also to Hyperbole, the best podcast ever. That's the title and the truth. Featuring the best and worst of everything each week in pop culture, news, local drama, hashtags, and interviews with cool people you need to know. Available everywhere you podcast. Big thanks also to The Ten Spot, a clinically clean beauty bar at 45th in France. Mention Morningside After Dark and receive 15% off ten, uh, 10 Spot services. Now, this is exciting. Look under your chair. There is a, there's a winner somewhere in this room. Look under your chair, and we need to know who you are. Underneath your chair. This is exciting. Do we... Is there... We cast about, anyone find anything under their chair except their one mitten? Tape to the bottom of the chair. Hold, you've really got to use, this is where your yoga skills will come in handy. Do, downward facing card, anyone? We got it, okay. We have a winner and you have won $50 to the 10 spot. Congratulations. Fun. Be sure to warm down. Uh, we also want to thank Rebecca and Mark Sorensen for their continued sponsorship. Let's hear it for Rebecca and Mark. Thank you. Okay, we're about to begin. Please note our emergency exits along the walls here and in the back. Bathrooms are also located in the back of the hall. Uh, please help yourself to Starbucks coffee during the show. Am I doing this show? Okay, I was like, they're just laughing. Okay. Yes, uh, air traffic control. Uh, but let's get started, shall we? Okay. Opening up our show tonight, we have two vital Twin Cities musicians whose individual contributions to our local scene are impossible to measure. He is a soulful trumpet player who plays with the Bad Blood Trio and many others. She is a ukulele virtuoso of the UK who has written a bespoke new song for the show tonight. Let's hear it for Katie Vernon and Paul Odegaard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I did not have a song for this theme. I had a sweater, but I didn't have a song. Um, and so I was like, I don't need to play because I, I have nothing to sing about. Um, and then I thought, oh, wait, I'm a songwriter. I could actually write a song. That's what I do. So I decided to write a song. And then as soon as I had the idea, I was crippled with anxiety. And that's why I'm a member of uh, Dissonance over there. Um, and uh, so I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to write a song about the idea I had? Because it's heavy and it's sad and it's difficult. And I pushed through it because um, that's why I write songs. And um, mental health and, and grief and all that kind of stuff is, is the reason that I um, became a songwriter in the first place. So the very, very quick story about this song is that... Um, my mom passed away when I was 12, and I had no recordings of her. I had no moving pictures of her, um, and I didn't hear her voice for um, 34 years. And then I tracked down via the internet a little, a little clip of her from a news show that she was on in the 80s, um, which was kind of an amazing thing to be able to find and share with my brother. And we got to hear our mom again, after all that time, which was amazing. Um, so it's a really long story, and I wrote a whole blog about it. So it's on the dissonance.org website, if you want to see the whole story. Um, and then my good patient friend, Paul Odegaard, uh, is here to play it with me tonight. So this is the first time I've ever performed it, so we'll see how it goes. I have to start on the right uh, thing here. Virtuoso, it's like there's a lot of pressure. Okay, here we go.
after 34 years of silence, a way to reel you in, pull you back from a distance. So much of my life, I never had a choice, but I never gave up hope that I'd hear my mother. After 34 years of silence, a way to reel you in, pull you back from the distance. So much of my life, I never had a choice, but I never gave up hope that I'd hear my mother's voice. I'd get to hear your voice again. Oh. Thank you. <laughs>Savage writer in living color who writes for political, social, and economical change and black futures, he strives to weave traditional forms and techniques with the vibrancy of African American experience and speech. An inspirational English teacher, a parent and partner, and a beleaguered Chicago Bears fan, we're thrilled to welcome back Lester Batiste. What up? Thank you so much for having me again. It's so, so nice to be back. Tonight I have a few poems for you all on the topic of moving images. This first piece that I'm going to read is entitled The Red Hat Club at TNB's Bar Night in Waterville, Maine. The sea of red is not blood or wine, has a touch of cherry felt with a sprinkle of laughter to sway the crowd towards a more classic look. Their skin is old and resembles fall birch trees once through the shaper. Their voices hit the hot tin roof and whistle, reverberating through the air as it contends with the smell of beer from the tap and the streaks of gray to see who dominates this room full of strangers and friends, mothers, daughters, and aunts who share the love of the false king and indulge in touching his patootie as he jitters past them with the speed of a sexy sloth. <laughs> Moving his hips towards the geriatric Judys, Janes, and Janices, the Sharons, Chanel's, and Sheila's get mad, so they signal to Elvis with the wink of Andrew Jackson and his twin brother idly nestled between breast or the two midgets wrestling in her shirt every time Sharon moves. And with the click of his blue suede shoes, the bar transforms into a doom of dastardly debauchery. <laughs> the 
This next piece is dedicated to the north side of Minneapolis. That's where I currently reside, and I've been living there for the past, what, seven, six years now. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago, as Jim notoriously said. I'm a Bears fan, so you know. We're trying to figure it out, but I got mad love for the north side, and this particular poem is dedicated to that place. This particular piece is called, After the Virus, Royalty Came Back to Rule the Land. Sitting here at the dining room table, sun bouncing and shifting through the curtains, with sleep still left in the panes, Wide eyes gaze at Farview Park. Some do-ragged, some hooded, sagging pants with creaseless Jordans. Kings and queens spring and splash on the half court. A white tee hulks a half-moon chuck from behind the arc. Dreads dance and dangle as another jumps towards the block. The brightness of his shirt and the dampness of his sweat is pronounced in the crowning sun. Weighted blue jeans jerk high, then sink low in the height of their leaps. Another king touches down victorious as the ball ricochets through the peach ring. A, a queen reaches for the rebound and blasts back can't believe that weak ass shit went in. <laughs> At that second, a mosh pit with no hits, grips, or fists, clinch commences. Hands hoist up beltless back pockets back into place. They rejoice like other marginalized bodies waiting to scream Mazel Tov. But they yell Kobe, Curry, or Bang Bang with the crane of contorted wrist left broken. The commotion of black bodies simply enjoying stops some more kings cruising three to a bike. One tank top toddler atop handlebars as his big sister handles the pedaling and their corn rolled cousin projects directions, calling out cars as they ride across Lindale Avenue North. A new game starts. One king possesses the ball, begins to dribble, jukes left, throws hips right, head fakes twice with other limbs to throw off his op. Sire shoots, then the concrete choreograph begins anew, the ballet broken by shoot for it, used to settle disputes, while hydration is puckered from a peach knee high. This last piece I'll read to you all, then I'll get out of here. This last poem is entitled Black Antiques Part One. This piece has an epigraph. The epigraph is taken from an NPR news article written by Robert Stein. The epigraph reads, the deaths caused by COVID-19 have reduced overall life expectancy by 1.131 years, according to the analysis by researchers at the University of Southern California and Princeton University. The reduction in life expectancy is estimated to be even greater among racial and ethnic minorities. Life expectancy is estimated to fall by 2.10 years among blacks and 3.05 years among Latinos. The decline would be 0 0.68 years among whites. Why can't we all grow old? Advance in age just as sun rays slug through the day. Why not white hair instead of salt and pepper crowns? Why can't we rule land in our castles until we pass and pass it down? Why can't we leave a leg up, you see? Not inscribed by them, but us, you see? Why can't my homies not trap out the bando and everywhere we stay? 
Why can't I make it with my day ones? My friends who grew with me now take aim. Why will others see life in their 80s, 90s? I'm stuck at 65. Why can't I imagine times of my great grandkids, not plots, tombstones, or graves? Why can't this country turn down the melting pot from boiling over with rage? Why can't I simply live? How can I survive to become a black antique? Thank you. An indie folk lo-fi electronica duo from Minneapolis, bandmates and life partners Jake and Sarah explore vulnerability in the human experience. Fired Up is their new album and declaration of self-love in unseen spaces. Playing an original song tonight, we are delighted to welcome Seavers. Oh, there it is. Give it up for the sound guy. I don't know how you mix all these different acts. Amazing. So we're receivers. Um, we are uh, a lo-fi electronica band, but we also do acoustic sometimes, especially when there's all the rotation going on. So tonight you'll be hearing us um, in more acoustic setting. And we're actually going to do a cover song tonight. When we were thinking about moving pictures, I love songs that just immediately take you to a film. Like you hear a song and the only context you have for it. Sometimes you're like, I don't even know how I know the song, but I know it's a movie somewhere. Um, and this is one of those songs for us. Um, we like to just kind of reimagine things too, so hearing a song done really differently uh, is fun for us to do. So we're playing a song from Fight Club movie. Anyone know Fight Club? Yeah? This song just automatically, I don't even actually like the movie, but it made me like the song and you love it too, so we hope you guys enjoy it. We've got a little merch table back there if you want to come say hi. Or oh, yeah. Grab a t-shirt and we got prints and stuff. It's all for free. Donate what you want, but yeah, hope you guys enjoy. So. With your feet in the air and your head on the ground Try this trick and spin it, yeah Your head will collapse if there's nothing in it And you ask yourself
try this trick and spin it Your head will collapse If there's nothing in it And you'll ask yourself Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Where is my mind? A native Southern Californian and mother of three, she brings a spirit of adventure to, and fun to her art, writing, and life. She recently wrote and directed The Gathering, a whoops, short film exploring the impact of COVID. She's here tonight to read a new piece. Welcome back, Suzanne Fenton. This is a piece called Sunset Boulevard, and it's sort of a condensed version of how I became a filmmaker. I'm an escape artist and still get a rush whenever I see the Hollywood sign from any distance on a clear day or whizzing past Sunset Boulevard and Mulholland Drive. For me, Hollywood ghosts and glamour never get old. My first favorite film was the 1950 film noir classic, Sunset Boulevard, which I discovered as a latchkey kid. The fact it won three Academy Awards and Gloria Swanson looked like my grandma didn't begin to explain why black and white film this noir and surreal would ever appeal to an eight-year-old. I loved impersonating the aged out and irrelevant silent film star Norma Desmond having a psychotic break. Without warning or context, I tilt my head staring off at nothing with manic eyes and walk towards my mom and sisters repeating, I'm a star, while rotating my hands like a belly dancer on quaaludes. <laughs> I learned that people like to be entertained, but entertaining oneself is the gift that keeps on giving. When I was 11, I was the third wheel on my mom's date to see the double feature Harold and Maude and French anti-war masterpiece, The King of Hearts. Not particularly age appropriate, but still my faves for their depictions of love, loss, loneliness, and being misunderstood. And a good reminder to question who is calling whom crazy. This early introduction to deep dark satire and foreign film taught me that no topic or truth is too painful or off limits if it's balanced with humor. Thanks, Mom. Through adolescence, my raging hormones replaced a discerning eye with larger-than-life pretend boyfriends. I lost track of how many times I endured Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and yet the only storyline worth remembering is sneaking into the theater to give Barry Gibb two thumbs up in his tight-fitting red satin this and orange satin brocade that. At the final screening, my mom insisted Latchkey Suze accompany my older sister on her first date with a temple hottie, but I sat in the row behind them because she was pissed. And this was before my plan to bring Barry home. Each time he appeared on screen, I'd stand, take a flash photo that illuminated the entire theater, <laughs> then crouch down low in my seat. Sister whiplashed herself, spinning around 24 times, telling me to knock it off. Even worse, those precious photos became three by five poop brown glossies, and the only decipherable image was the outline of Peter Frampton's hair after being electrocuted. No Barry and no second date. When The Blue Lagoon was released, starring Brooke Shields and Babe and a Half, Christopher Atkins, not even, incest not even incestuous cousins on a deserted island could stop me from watching his bleach blonde curls 
tan bod and loincloth until I knew every pathetic line of dialogue by heart and still have the letter I wrote to him. <laughs> Dear Chris, you were so excellent in the movie. You seem so sincere and lovable. I wish I, underlined several times, could have made this movie with you, exclamation point. <laughs> and then it gets real. To me, you rank right up there with Maxwell Smart, and he's number one on my list. <laughs> what I learned from Hollywood spectacles is that eye candy is necessary, but can never fix what's broken. Before Minnesota Marriage and Motherhood, I always believed I'd make a film, and approached each day like I was the producer, director, actor, and costumer in the story of my life. Navigating adventures, heartache, twists and turns, joys and failures that eventually connect to drive the plot along. For decades, I let this dream live on in my mind, eventually collecting dust, but never once let it out of my sightline. But life is about choices, and dreams get shelved or bypassed altogether. When my second son was on the cusp of leaving the nest, I had a jarring out-of-body experience where I saw two scenarios quite clearly. The first was of me with a head full of dreams, and the second was me pursuing those dreams. The past, present, and future converged and conspired to inform me that I would be fucking miserable if I didn't proactively redefine myself before the nest was completely empty. So as my sons, one by one, reminded me that my services, sage maternal offerings, and advice were no longer required, I reimagined that painful void as a Mother's Day gift of newfound space. I could see the breadcrumbs I dropped along the way and would follow them back to myself, ready to lean into whatever opportunity might present itself. And that's when a friend gave me a script about an aging artist at a crossroads. We met at the legendary Culver Hotel a few blocks away from the old MGM lot. We shook hands, clinked glasses, and I became executive producer of Hollywood Fringe, starring Justin Kirk that's streaming on Prime. It was incredibly gratifying and fun to be so involved on in a meaningful feature film from start to finish, but it wasn't mine. The only way to learn how is by doing, so I decided to make a short film. Once I had the idea, once I had the idea for the gathering, the script wrote itself. I bounced it off my husband, mom, and two friends who cheered me on. For a year, I told almost no one what I was up to, because any number of issues can derail a film production, including my own self-doubt. So the fewer people who knew about it, the better, in case it didn't happen. Plus, I needed to harness every ounce of my energy to focus on the task at hand. Shooting a two-day film in one day with 12 actors during COVID and no wiggle room for glitches. The week before go time, my sister asked me what was new with me, and I told her I was making a movie. I was done discussing my dreams. It was time to realize them. Thank you. Quick, his quick historical note in the neighborhood regarding Harold and Maude. Some of you know this, but... The Westgate Morningside Theater, which was right here, became a dry cleaners not too long ago. Uh, for 1,957 straight showings, they showed Harold and Maude. For over two years into the third year, people were protesting it was a problem. But it helped make that a cult film in the, in the nation. So just a little local history for you. Right, George? Okay. Speaking of local history, making local history are, is this next group. Every summer for the last 14 years, this very church basement has transformed into a theater. They work fast and fun to bring the best of everyone's abilities to the stage. This year, in, from March 10th through 12th, their first full community production with cast members ranging from ages 8 to 80 is flying upstairs to the sanctuary. Let's hear it for the cast of Mary Poppins and the Morningside Theatre Company. <laughs> preview performance from the major motion picture turned musical Mary Poppins. Jane! Michael! You lost another nanny! What are you gonna do about it? You wanna come on stage? 
stage and tell us? Wanted a nanny for two adorable children. If you want this choice position, have a cheery disposition. Rosy cheeks, no warts. That's the part I put in. Um, this has been quite a difficult night for me, so I just want to thank you all. Um, kind of, I'm going through something right now. Um, I guess I didn't get the role of Mary Poppins. Um, just, just found that out, so. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, lovely, very, very nice. Okay, uh, born and raised in Minneapolis, he is the author of five acclaimed books. His novel, Wintering, won the Minnesota Book Award in fiction, and his most recent novel, The Ski Jumpers, has earned widespread acclaim. Please welcome back Peter Guy.
Excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, in the spirit of tonight's theme, I've selected a passage from my latest novel, a book called The Ski Jumpers. It is a story about family and love and secrets and lies and ski jumping, of course. Uh, the scene I'm going to read comes early in the novel. It's a winter's night in 2014, the night of John and Anton Bargard's father's funeral. Uh, John is at the apartment of his mostly estranged brother, Anton, in North Minneapolis. They're about to embark on the night of their lives, but first Anton has some business to take care of. Then I was alone in Anton's living room with only the whir of the antique movie projector and the voice of Jack Brickhouse, the famous Chicago sportscaster. Welcome to Soldier Field, sports fans. What stands before me is 150 feet of towering thrills. It's been 17 years since the city has seen something like this. More than 100 daredevil ski jumpers from all over the world competing in an out-of-season competition in front of thousands of you. The footage panned the crowd. Men in fedoras and trench coats, women in dresses and matching hats and scarves. The jump was towering indeed, rising from the colonnades like a ramp to heaven. The camera zoomed to the top of it, where four American flags whipped in the wind. Will it be world champion Erling Erlinson here from Sweden who takes home the victory? Or the Olympic champion, Norwegian Arnfinn Bergman? Again, the camera cut away <clears throat> to Bergman, mugging for a throng of adoring young women. Or will it be America's hope, Chicago's own Jacob Bargard, who sets the standard? The camera caught Pops in silhouette, his skis on his shoulder, a cigarette pinched between his lips, his V-neck sweater across his slight shoulders. He glanced at the camera, winked, and disappeared into the parade of jumpers. The film spliced, and when it came back on, it was to the stage at the end of the hay-strewn soldier field turf which served as the outrun. It spliced again and picked up in the middle of Lena Ling's rendition of the national anthem. Her voice cut in and out, but her lips kept singing. Her hands stayed on her heart, and for all I tried to blink him away, the man standing at the bottom of the staircase remained a young Magnus Shebney. He wore a long leather duster, was damn near the size of the car parked beside him. Still again, the film cut out, and for a while, only single images would flit across the screen. A shot of the crowd, the announcer on the stage, a ski jumper crashing through the hay bales. Occasionally, a jumper in mid-flight or landing or standing at the top of the scaffold. It was like listening to someone talk and only hearing every tenth word. But then for 20 or 30 seconds, the film and the announcer's voice would steady and come out together. A sequence of four jumpers in a row with exclamations of their daring and courage. Here's the finished jumper, Matty Rontanen, ready to make his leap. Can he best the 112 footer of the last flyer? He's in the air. Brick's house voice gave way to the clicking of the film. But the image of the finished ski jumper flying down the scaffold at Landing Hill did not. He was the picture of elegance, his feet locked together, his skis like a single plank, his body purposeful, following his outthrust chin, his hands locked and leading the way. Even through the choppy footage, he appeared to not even twitch, not even blink, and when he landed, his skis still ramrod straight and locked together, his arms thrown wide, fingertips up. He had about him a stoic, an emotionless perfection. 110 fleet for the flying fin, Brick's house voice sing song as Rontanen slid into the hay bales. And now we're down to the final three jumpers in our competition. First up, a fellow who could have taken the L to the stadium today, the local favorite, Jacob the Bird Bargard. Only the roar of the crowd accompanied Pops as he kicked out of the start. He threw his hands in front of him and crouched impossibly low. So low his ass seemed almost to rest on the tail of his skis. 
Did the film go to slow motion? Did the absence of Brickshouse's voice intone admiration and hopefulness and respect? Could I actually recognize in the grainy image of Pop's face the aspect of a man I knew to be utterly and unfailingly determined on this, his favorite subject in this, his most important moment? Did the concentration that attended that look give way to bliss, plainly and simply, as he sprang from the takeoff, as he settled his hands not out beyond his face like nearly all the jumpers who had come before him, but at his sides? Did he pause there at the top of his flight and ride on the exhalations of 30,000 Chicagoans? Did Lena Ling cross his mind? Did the sound of her voice singing blow me a kiss, blow me a kiss from across the room lift his hopes? Or was it the hand of his redeemer lifting him by the back of his sweater? Surely there was something more than the Zephyr off Lake Michigan because where the other hundred jumpers had reached their zenith somewhere over the makeshift knoll, Pops kept rising. It looked like he would never land. It looked, and I recall now that this is what he always said, that he wouldn't land until he was in Minneapolis <laughs> with Lena and her sister, his wife, my mother, Bet. Unsubscribed from reality as we know it, our next artist is a Minneapolis-based pop artist, producer, and vocalist using hyperpop and alternative, alternative aesthetics to inspire a renaissance of the early 2000s rave culture. Please welcome Sim One. Hello. Oh, wow. Uh, what's everyone's name? <laughs> okay, I'll remember that for later. Um, this song, I didn't write it for the theme of the night. I didn't know if I was supposed to do that or not, but it is a newer song that I wrote just like a few weeks ago. And when I was writing it, I saw I kind of see like, like a video play out in my head whenever I'm making a new song. And with this one, um, it's about like being numb to love after heartbreak and not being able to feel that anymore. But then you feel it again and it's kind of like this magical moment in a movie where like, all of the lights dim down and then the the spotlights happen and like they're following you around. Uh, so that's kind of what this song uh, is about. No time for names, no who we are. In the melody, no time for space. Lost in the stars When you turn to me The ground melts away Nothing conceals In the melody Lost in your gaze I wanna feel I'm making all this up Could you tell I'm not myself
people like it's a show it's like it's in a church but it's not like church so. <laughs> it's hard to describe thank you for all being here uh, a revered author musician songwriter and performing artist whose performances have made him a vital presence in Minneapolis and well beyond his new album happiness is a compliment to his book the happiness playlist Put your hands together for the singular Mark Molman. Hi. I uh, was here a couple years ago. I read from a book that I had just finished called The Happiness Playlist. And <clears throat> I've recently read a quote. Uh, by Dorothy Parker, who said something like, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase, uh, something like, um, writing sucks, but having written is awesome. That's <laughs> me paraphrasing a great writer. <laughs> and I, I do not enjoy writing, but I like, I like having stories. And this is from my upcoming book. Uh, <clears throat> and I, this is the first time I've anybody's heard anything from it. So, <clears throat> so Torben Ulrich. Uh, was a professional Danish uh, tennis player. He played over 100 Davis Cup matches for Denmark from the 40s through the 1970s. And through his full life, he received several awards for contributions in athletics, art, and culture. Now, Torben is still alive today, but his greatest contribution to the world happened in 1963. Torben Ulrich had a son, a son named Lars. Lars Ulrich. A baby born without a middle name, whose first concert was Deep Purple with his father at the age of nine. In 1988, director Tim Burton cast actor Michael Keaton for the role of Batman. Thousands of comic book fans wrote Warner Brothers Studios in an uproar. Burton was hired to direct based on the success of his 1985 film, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. So the skepticism was understandable. Considered for the role of the Cape Crusader were Mel Gibson, Kevin Costner, and Harrison Ford. But Burton went with Keaton after having directed him in Beetlejuice. All 50,000 letters of dissent to Warners rang on deaf ears. And in 1989, Mr. Mom, as Bruce Wayne, would proclaim to the world, You want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. In 1935, Milwaukee entrepreneur Ben Marcus purchased a movie theater in Rapon, Wisconsin. With this, the Marcus Corporation was formed. By 1958, Marcus Corp operated 36 theaters across Wisconsin. In 1972, Marcus went public. By 1983, with the numbers of cinemas topping 80, a seven-screen multiplex named West Town Cinemas opened behind I-94 off, off the Blue Mound Behind I, the I-94 off-ramp on Blue Mound Boulevard in Waukesha, Wisconsin, I was 10 years old. In the coming years, I would see hundreds of movies here. On Saturday noons, afternoons at 14, I was dropped off at West Town Cinemas at noon. I'd be picked up at 11 p.m., having seen close to, if not all, seven features. 
Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Harry and the Hendersons, Hellraiser, The Untouchables, Howard the Duck, Mannequin, The Fly, The Hunt for Red October, The Last Starfighter, and a flop of a movie I'm still struggling to erase from my psyche. Burglar, starring Bobcat Goldthwait and Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Until Burglar, all film was magic. Everything was a dream. Life paled in comparison, but Burglar took my innocence. It was something German-born spiritual leader and self-help author Eckhart Tolle might call today a pain body. Metallica would release their fourth album, And Justice for All, on September 7th, 1988. Four days later, on September 11th, they'd begin a year-long world tour in Budapest, Hungary. On Saturday, June 24th, 1989, Metallica found themselves in the Midwest. On Wednesday, June 21st, Metallica played at Bonner Springs Amphitheater in Bonner Springs, Kansas, with their next performance being Alpine Valley Amphitheater in Elkhorn, Wisconsin on Saturday the 24th. Both bands, The Cult, the opening band, and Metallica had Thursday and Friday off from performing. I was 16 years old and I didn't give a shit about Metallica. What mattered to me was Tim Burton's Batman starring Michael Keaton. On Friday, June 23rd, 1989, it would debut in 2,194 theaters across America. The evening premiere screening in Waukesha, Wisconsin was at Marcus Cinema's West Town Cineplex at 7.20 p.m. What's pivotal about Metallica's And Justice For All is that even though And Justice For All broke through the top 10 and would eventually receive a Grammy nomination, it would pale in comparison to what would be in 1991, the self-titled Metallica, which remains one of the best-selling albums of all time. So in 1999, how I would like to say it is that Metallica was not big enough to rent out the entire movie theater, but they were big enough to rope off the center 20 aisles of a movie theater. In the early years, I watched movies close to the screen, front row, always center, immersed in the light reflected. But as I grew up into a more refined 12 and 13 year old, I'd move backwards, and by 16, my preferred seat was at the heart of the room. But my entry to Batman at 6.50 p.m., a perimeter of velvet ropes fenced me out. I was gutted. 4,361 miles away, the Berlin Wall would not come down until November 9th of that year, but the parallel was sickeningly analogous to my plight. <laughs> Disparaged, I chose the center longitude of 15 rows. Oddly, though, one seat in from the aisle. I've looked back at this story countless times. There's no explanation why I left that seat open other than destiny. Even with the roped-off Parthenon of mysterious elitists occupied, that seat in the aisle next to me stayed empty. How fortunate, I thought as the credits begin that I, a lowly Michael Keaton fan in a sold-out movie theater, have a place for my soda and my coat. Dear Lord, thou art kind. <laughs> but the devil trailed in tow. And just as the words Billy D. Williams and Jack Palance graced the screen, stumbling and tripping down the cinema aisle came a drunken wraith. It snarled, and then, spilling into the empty seat beside me, it belched. Yeah. It was like someone dropped a rum and Gatorade-soaked sweat sot from the rafters. The creature blathered nonsense at the screen, but no usher came. Despite some jeering from patrons nearby, the beast remained in the theater, in the seat. I thought to myself, curse you, Ben Marcus of the Marcus Theaters Corporation. <laughs> then... As Bruce Wayne and Vicki Vale galloped on horseback into the Wayne estate riding stables at sundown, the vagrant retired. With a snort and a grumble, he passed out. His head faced the ceiling like a fresh corpse. <laughs> Finally, I could relish Keaton's breakthrough opus in peace. The Batman breathed me in, mesmerizing, exquisite. Never in the history of moving pictures had a saga bloomed with such genius, such grace. Not since the mask of Agamemnon. Not since the column of Marcus Aurelius. 
Tim Burton's Batman starring Michael Keaton as Batman was everything I knew it had to be. As Kim Basinger says in the film in the final line, I'm not surprised, Alfred. I'm not surprised. <laughs> the lights came back and I morphed back into a 16-year-old teen. I stood up and I turned to exit. Two boots blocked my way. Two boots affixed to ripped jeans below a back black t-shirt under a leather motorcycle jacket dripped over a still inebriated but awakened man-child. Our eyes met. Move your feet, I snapped. They fell to the ground. I pushed past. The other members of Metallica exited the theater among the crowd. As I reached the door, I turned to look behind. He swayed like a limp willow tree in a field of red chairs and carpet-lined walls. A baby, born without a middle name, whose first concert was Deep Purple with his father at the age of nine, Lars Ulrich, drummer of Metallica. It's a true story. Yeah. Ah, excellent, excellent. Writing moody, electric Americana originals and reimagining covers, they are regulars at the Astor Cafe, the White Squirrel Bar, Parkway Theater, the Driftwood, and more. They are currently recording their first EP for a May release. That is so ballsy to actually say when you're going to release it. Oh, all right, good luck with that. Um, please welcome the Minneapolis duo on guitar and vocals, Shannon Patini, and on percussion, Joseph Patini. They are the Danger Pins. We're so happy to be here. We'd like to do a song of ours, and in keeping with the theme tonight, it's a murder ballad in search of a short film. <laughs> it's called Red. <laughs>
Essayist and autoethnographer, she is the author of the young adult hybrid novel Saints of the Household. She belongs to the Bri Bri people, an indigenous tribe of Costa Rica, and tonight she will read poems from her newest work. Please welcome in person at Morningside After Dark for the first time Ari Tyson. Thank you. I, I'm super thrilled to be reading from my forthcoming debut, which comes out at the end of March. Um, this is Saints of the Household. And, you know, in the theme of moving pictures, I was thinking, oh, what, what should I read? Um, 
And I figured, why don't we go to ancient moving pictures, right? What did we have before film? Well, we had grandma telling stories. Um, and so I have, I'm gonna take us back a few thousand years here. Um, this is a translation of one of our stories um, called The Two Men and the Mystical Eagles, um, which I helped translate for its first time into English with my Brie Brie mentor. So it's a kind of exciting to get to share it with you all. A um, little bit about this book. Um, the, these two brothers are um, uh, Bri Bri as well, but they um, are on their healing journeys after growing up in an abusive household. So a little bit of a trigger warning, because after I read this um, myth, I'll be switching from their perspectives. Um, and yeah, so just take care of yourself if you're in that crew. Okay, the two men and the mystical eagles. Growing up, mom would tell us the story of the mystical eagles so often before bed that I can't remember not knowing it. The mystical eagles were the dragons of Talamanca, large beaks, black inky wings, and machete talons. They'd come down from the mountains, tearing children from their mother's arms, snatching those who went out in the day from the pathways. The mystical eagles had become so terrifying that our people didn't leave home in fear of never returning. The whole tribe decided to fast, and the two young men were chosen to stop the eagles. They went to their awa, and he blessed their knives, rope, and tobacco. Then a few women wove a basket so large, so strong, with huge handles so it would be so easy to snatch and carry. In the night, the men slipped into the basket, and the female eagle came and took it high to a nest of bones where her two growing chicks were hungry. There, the two young men smoked the tobacco, and like bees, the female and two young mystical chicks fell asleep, then fell from the mountain to their deaths. Finally, the male eagle came, and the men again began to smoke, and to, he too fell asleep, and when he did, they swiftly took a knife to his throat and cut him to pieces. They had succeeded. Then the men looked down from the nest and could see their people's homes. With their rope, they lowered themselves from the mountain right down to Sibuti, the river where Cebu swam. There they made a canoe that led them back to Talamanca, where our people were finally safe. The mystical eagles never returned. This myth served as a metaphor for these boys' journeys. You might kind of sense that a little bit um, in the next uh, excerpt I'm going to read. Okay, this is the first one. We're going we're gonna to go to church, right? We're going from like the bush to church now. Okay, <laughs> uh, but that's what we're doing. Uh, communion. This is the first vignette in the book, in Jay's perspective. We hold deep, dark cups dark like the cloth that they bring out on Monday, Thursday to place over the cross and the tables at Hope Oak Church. I keep crying at the time of reflection, asking God for forgiveness, for kicking the neighbor's dog, for shouting at the sky, for beating up that boy, and maybe even worse, for hurting Nicole. I can't stop thinking about it. Before I am told to eat the cracker and drink the two-inch cup of black red wine, Hold the cup tight enough, and you can see your heart beating in the surface, even when you doubt it's there. First day back. People try not to look at us in the hallway. After we'd been suspended for two weeks, our classmates scatter like we might swallow them. Us, these angry brown boys ready to snap. What does it mean when we scare everyone, the good and the bad? Maybe someday I will walk down the hall and someone will see human in me. It won't just be mom, God, and Max. And Nicole, is she in that group? I haven't seen her since the woods, only DMing her my apologies, no response. Max follows close behind, his coyote eyes averting, and I feel all my pull-ups bulk in my shoulders, my stomach and the veins that plump thick down my forearms. I keep my chin up, keep my lips tight, and I am grateful that we are taller than most. This way, I can't see their eyes, their fear of us. This way, I am not tempted to want more. 
All right, I'm going to read one last little poem piece here. This is from Max's perspective, and he's kind of a romantic painter. Mom's cries last night stick with me. They flash a bright, painful green. I fell asleep crying, woke up sore and salty on my face. My hands are overstretched from holding Dad's arms back last night. For once, I want to see the beauty of the world flung back at me. From the garage, I get my painting stuff, place my school easel in the passenger seat, paints in a bag, and with my mom's keys, my hand to the wheel, foot to the pedal, I leave. Leaving is a breath of clean, just rained air, even if it really is the dullest February. I expect a tree to speak to me, or a broken light in a parking lot, but near the river, when I drive past the trailer park, I see melody. In my mind, everyone is a painting. I can ask the trees for permission, and they know me so well that I don't of, they don't often say no. But now, I'm biting my cheeks, looking down at my bag. Paints adding up. Thank you all. <laughs> A songwriter, arranger, and producer. His latest EP, Deep Winter, is on regular rotation on The Current. Came out January 28th. Dan Shaw describes Thomas Aban as uncompromising, mystical, mysterious, ethereal, with an artistic voice all his own, hard to categorize and harder to ignore. His music balances the accessible with the bewildering. We are thrilled to welcome him tonight, Thomas Aban. Oh uh... 
Thank you. Following his celebrated debut, Everything Lost is Found Again, his recent book of essays, Farewell Transmission, Notes from Hidden Spaces, is a finalist for this year's Minnesota Book Award in nonfiction. His work fuses anthropology, travel, music, and everything in between. We're so proud to welcome him back, Bill Wennington's spiritual twin, Will McGrath. All right. Thanks so much to Jim for that uh, obvious deep cut Chicago knowledge there. Um, all right. Hi, I'm Will. Thanks all for coming out tonight. I am very excited to be back here at Morningside After Dark. I might be a little biased, but this has got to be one of the best rooms to perform in in the Twin Cities here. <laughs> so thanks all for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm going to read a quick little passage from my new book, Farewell Transmission. Uh, these are essays about all sorts of interesting characters from the fringes of society and various subcultures. Um, and I thought since we're talking about moving pictures, I would read to you uh, about that most cinematic of sporting endeavors, which of course is professional wrestling. Um, <laughs> which is a, a subject I didn't know much about until very recently. Um, I had followed it as a kid, and then not since. And then I recently learned that Minnesota has this very vibrant indie wrestling scene, which is kind of like if the minor leagues or the, the farm system. It's filled with all these hustlers and dreamers trying to make it into the big leagues of professional wrestling. So I spent about a year kind of living in this world and going to matches and following all the interesting characters in this world. So I'm going to read a little excerpt from this essay about the Minnesota indie wrestling scene uh, and what brought me into it. It starts with a little flashback. <clears throat> Chicago, northwest side. The last time I paid attention to professional wrestling was circa 1990 when I went to Mike Murphy's 10th birthday party to watch WrestleMania VI available exclusively on pay-per-view. We smashed through the Murphy basement rec room, a sunken place filled with boxes of unlabeled VHS tapes and unpaired shin guards and we watched the ultimate warrior defeat Hulk Hogan, a result that split the room. Most of the boys were there in support of the Hulkster, understood to be the shirt-ripping paragon of American masculinity, although no one in the room had yet descended a testicle, so judgments into the nature of gender performance were potentially underinformed. The contrarians in the basement were pleased with the Ultimate Warrior's victory, but then Kev Dennehy said wrestling was fake anyway, which we all more or less knew, but which sounded distinctly like sour grapes in the moment, so the birthday boy socked Kev in the stomach. <laughs> that conflict was overshadowed when Zakowski dared himself to drink a styrofoam cupful of all the different pops blended together a suicide in our regional parlance, and straightaway vomited. The Murphy matriarch evicted us then into the night to run off our collective sugar high. In early high school, I knew one kid who was very into professional wrestling, a small boy who delighted in feeding live mice to his pet snake. I watched him plop one of the squirming creatures into his terrarium some lazy Saturday afternoon. The mouse froze before the dead-eyed reptile coiled in glacial stillness. And then the mouse was gone, a flicker of movement, a foot kicking frantically between the snake's jaws. That boy's room was plastered with wrestling posters. The undertaker watched over this execution with us his gaze steely beneath layers of goth eyeshadow and the lank, inky veil of his hair. 
His pecs were agleam with oil, maple glazed and set for the roaster. I felt a kind of sleepy nausea seep into my belly, began to sweat. I told the small boy I had to go and never came back. <laughs> American Legion number 435, Minneapolis, present day. One night my buddy Victor called me up. You want to come see the wrestling, he said. It's at the American Legion. Of course I want to come see the wrestling at the American Legion, I said, choking with indignation. I had not thought about professional wrestling for several decades at this point. But come Friday night, the two of us stormed into the Legion, hot for combat. We swept past the horseshoe bar and into the packed community hall, the crowd adorned in flannel, camo, blaze orange, plaid, and Carhartt, all the shades of Minnesota's rainbow. <laughs> At the inner bar, a woman jounced her infant in a baby Bjorn as she waited on a captain and diet. High above us, the preamble to the Constitution of the American Legion was painted across the walls, urging us toward law and order in joining us to perpetuate 100% Americanism. When the national anthem struck up over the sound system, so flag bedecked was the hall that people were facing all different directions, <laughs> hand on heart, each to his own personal stars and stripes. Then the bell rang and some long dormant instinct asserted dominion over my body. I blacked out briefly and came to screaming, do your job, ref, through mouthfuls of commissary hot dog. Ancient muscle memory had emerged violently intact. I watched an arrogant man in jodhpurs and turtleneck stalk around the ring, flicking his riding crop, and I booed the man in jodhpurs. My body shook as I cursed him. He wore a seedy blonde mustache. <laughs> and while he did not physically touch it, his performance was that of a villainous mustache twirl brought to life. <laughs> Later, a cat man in luchador mask entered the ring to a meowing claws out chant led by the crowd. A gladiator in leather loincloth and shin greaves appeared. A man with green hair and green lightning bolt tights. These ruffians battled for our delectation, for our fealty. We roared in fury at the referee, that bumbling fool who never witnessed the cheap shot, never made the three count fast enough. We clawed our skulls in frustration as yet another pin was escaped. One, two, three, two, the ref would yell, wide-eyed, displaying two fingers for us as if holding the results of a stopwatch. Only two. Some months later, I found a recording of this event online, the telecast from Channel 45. There I found unimpeachable evidence that I had not dreamed this beautiful dream. Directly in the camera's line, Victor and I cackle like lunatics, calling for blood. Something inside me had thawed the 30-year winter that clutched my heart, losing purchase. Thank you. Their boisterous, intense songs exude raw energy, power, and urgency. As partners in the band Kiss the Tiger, they have quick, quickly risen to become the most kick-ass live act playing Minneapolis today. Please welcome guitarist and singer Michael Anderson and singer and force of nature Megan Kreidler. Hello everyone, the song is called I Miss You. I miss you and you miss me and the 
that's just how it's gonna be on and on I'm all alone now that's just how it's gonna be hey little lady hey little lady faltered from a world unknown hey little lady hey little lady carried you before you'd grown cause I'm on you and you miss me and that's the way it's gonna be far away but always here and that's the way it's gonna be hey pretty baby hey pretty baby left you when I found the flame Her debut novel, Prep, exploded as an instant bestseller. This launched a literary career and has, been, has seen her short stories and nonfiction published widely, and her six novels and short stories translated into 30 languages and have all been New York Times bestsellers. Helping her read from her highly anticipated novel, Romantic Comedy, and aptly cast as a brash young pop music, music sensation is our co-host, Jim Mahoney. Please welcome back Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, the 
Hi. Um, this is such an um, amazing night. It's so nice to leave the house and be reminded of all this talent um, in, in our city. So, okay, so my book, Romantic Comedy, is coming out April 4th, which is actually just like six weeks away. Um, and I think, I think this might be the first time I've, I or anyone else has publicly read from it. Um, so just a little bit of backstory, probably the short way to say it is it's a novel about Pete Davidson, but the, the, <laughs> lo the longer way is um, my family and I watched a lot of Saturday Night Live during the pandemic, and I noticed, as a lot of other people have, that there are, um, there's a pattern of sort of um, talented but like seemingly mortal or somewhat ordinary um, male cast members or writers on the show who end up dating and in some cases marrying um, female musicians or actresses who are like world famous, incredibly talented, incredibly gorgeous at the top of their game, household names. So there's this slight imbalance. Um, <laughs> and uh, I decided that I would write a novel to sort of escape from you know the pandemic and everything else, I would write a novel about um, like a, a, a female writer, the show is not called, it's called TNO, to, not like SNL at all, but um, <laughs> that she writes, uh, this, a writer for this, this show writes a sketch about how this s imbalanced pairing would never happen with an ordinary female writer and a world famous gorgeous male celebrity. And then that week, um, the musical guest and host are one and the same person. Who's, it's someone named Noah Brewster, who's a pop, um, a very popular pop singer, who will be played by Jim. Um, I, will, I, I will play the actress, um, or sorry, the, not the actress. She's very much not. She's a behind the scenes person. The writer, Sally, um, and Jim will play Noah. And, and also, I, I did, I sent this very messy copy. This is not written in script form, but anyway. Oh, sorry. And then the one other thing is, they're at the after party. It's um, 3.09 in the morning. Um, and Sally has previously, after working with Noah this week on a bunch of sketches, Sally has told him that after nine years at the show, she thinks she's going to leave and go write romantic comedies eventually. Okay, so now I'm going into my performance role. And, and as, I, as am I, I'm just going to get to rock star mode. Okay. <laughs> hey. Hey, congratulations. You were great. I don't know how you guys do it week in and week out. Um, but being the host and the musical guest is the craziest of all possible worlds. I could never do either, let alone both. And you really were awesome. Well, you were right about the cheesemonger. <laughs> no, you get credit. It's all in the delivery. Now, you will admit you've never really listened to my music. If I hadn't, how would I have written the sketch? Also, I'm a human being in the world. Do you think there's any man, woman, or child who hasn't heard making love in July while lying in the chair at the dentist's office? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you haven't listened beyond the bare minimum. You haven't listened on purpose. Also not true. I love the Bishop's Garden and all regrets. Here's what I'll admit. There are two categories of pop songs I'm not crazy about. And because making love in July, through no fault of its own, is in one of the categories, it biased me against you early on. I mean, almost 20 years ago. But I've realized that I underestimated the range of your, your oeuvre. <laughs> what kind of asshole do you think uses the word oeuvre in a bar at 3 in the morning? Just guessing, but maybe an asshole who went to Harvard. No, no, I'm not one of Tiano's Harvard assholes. Where'd you go? Duke. Oh, oh. as in the world-famous university in North Carolina? You mean that Duke? I get that having gone to Duke might not sound that different from having gone to Harvard, but trust me, the writers who went to Harvard think it is. Also, didn't you go to some fancy preppy high school in Washington, D.C.? Because I went to a gigantic, crappy public high school in suburban Kansas City. But I never went to college at all, so that negates my fancy prep school degree. I was supposed to go to Kenyon, but instead, I started busking at metro stations. Hey, when do I get to find out the two categories of songs you hate? 
Well, my disclaimer is that music isn't my area of expertise. Noted. So one category is the kind of song where it's about a long relationship or marriage, and the lyrics are like, sometimes it was so bad that we almost didn't make it, but we've survived. I think those songs are unintentionally funny because they're supposedly a celebration of the endurance of love or whatever, but the lyrics sound more like, being married to you is hell, but let's <laughs> congratulate ourselves for gutting it out. Mm. I guess I just never thought about that. There's a ton of them. We both were attracted to other people. You drove me crazy. I wanted to kill you, but baby, after all these years, you're still the one. <laughs> that actually might be a good sketch. Have you ever been to a wedding reception where they make all the married couples stand up and then the DJ says, sit down if you've been married less than 10 years, less than 20 years, less than 30 years, and the last one's standing or some 90-year-old couple who's been married since 1950? Did you meet my backup singer, Jimmy? I've only seen that at his wedding. I think it's not a wasp thing. I think you're right. But there could be a freeze frame on each couple as they're applauded, and they do a confessional. So all the other guests are like, this is so touching. And the 90-year-old woman is thinking to herself, for seven decades, the sound of his chewing has made me want to strangle him. <laughs> that would be funny, actually. Thanks, actually. The thing is, I'm pretty sure I've never written that kind of song, partly because I've never been married. Oh, sorry. Making Love in July is the other kind of song I was referring to. It's in the second category. That kind is always a man singing to a woman, and it's like, baby, you don't know how beautiful you are. You're so perfect. I never thought I'd find this. Am I in heaven? What's wrong with baby, you're so perfect? I never thought I'd find this. Am I in heaven? I don't like the you don't know how beautiful you are part. It makes it seem like the love is predicated either on a lack of awareness on the woman's part or else on her being insecure. And the woman in the songs is often both a child and a sexy enchantress. So the lyrics might as well be, I'm attracted to you because you conform to the standards agreed upon to be desirable at this moment in human history. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't even know it, and your cluelessness is what makes me feel like a real man. <laughs> it's probably a little wordy, <laughs> but point taken. Would you say it's similar to when the main character in a romantic comedy has flour on her nose after she made cookies and she doesn't know it? Because I've heard that's very annoying, too. Didn't I warn you about my rants? Oh, I, didn't I tell you I love rants? but I think you're conflating the second kind of song with something that's in a third category. Yeah, there are You Don't Know How Beautiful You Are songs, but I don't see those as automatically the same as the songs that are like, I can't believe you exist and I can't believe we found each other. When one of those is done well, doesn't it capture the most transcendent experience two people can have? Don't tell me you think falling in love is bullshit. Well, I don't want it to be. I don't get why you'd write scripts for romantic comedies if you think romance is cheesy nonsense. That's the point, though. I don't write from a point of clarity. I write out of confusion. OK, well, then tell me this. Can you define cheese for me? Because I still haven't figured out after two decades where the line is between cheese and emotional extravagance that's acceptable. What makes her song a movie or a moment in real life land on one side or the other? That's, why part of the, that's part of why the cheesemonger sketch hit a nerve for me. That's a good question, but the line is subjective, right? Kind of like the Supreme Court definition of obscenity being, I know it when I see it. <laughs> What's a song you think is legitimately non-cheesily romantic? At the risk of being predictable, there's an Indigo Girls song <laughs> called Dairy Queen that's probably my all-time favorite. Wait a second, isn't that a relationship that doesn't work out? Romance doesn't require a happy ending. Right, but you have to admit it's easier not to be cheesy when you're writing about lost love. Or are your romantic comedies going to end sadly, and that's their twist? I don't know how they end, because I haven't finished writing one yet. That's all. Thank you. Closing our show tonight are the neighborhood musicians who perform in several local bands and have been with Morningside After Dark from the very beginning. Let's hear it for Jim B. Ray, Nikki Williams, Ryan Williams, Colin Wells, Liz Heineke, Steve Diedrich, Mark Teske, and Jeffrey Lassig. They are the Teardowns. <laughs> oh, yeah, 
find those cords. Hang on, let me get down there for you. The other eight members could not make it tonight. <laughs> wow, what an incredible show. It's been great. Uh, so we are the Teardowns, your hyper-local uh, cover band. Like Seven of us are within a quarter mile of this venue. <laughs> and then we adopted Mark, who's a mile and a half away. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we normally do a cover, uh, apropos cover, uh, but this time we tried something a little different. Uh, back when the, the theme came out, um, Moving Pictures, I started to do some free association. Moving Pictures, motion, time, progress, science, technology. And I thought it would be a fascinating project to incorporate the, uh, the theme in both the creation of the song and the song itself. So, the geeks of the band, <laughs> Uh, asked ChatGPT to uh, <laughs> uh, to write a song for our band, Teardowns, uh, about moving pictures and the passage of time in the theme of the Talking Heads. And uh, after deliberating with uh, with the AI engine for a little bit, we landed on some lyrics, which Colin, our resident. Uh, English professor said had the quality of a well-adjusted 14-year-old boy. <laughs> but like, perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. So like most things written on ChatGPT. <laughs> Kids, be careful out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but equipped with those lyrics, we ditched the AI and uh, started to imagine the uh, melodies, structure, rhythm, tempo, and instrumentation uh, that could lead us to a real song. So... This is what ended up. This is our AI uh, uh, initiated song, Flipbook. A day by day Our Memories make us Cause us way Slow motion flip book in our mind Snapshot
thank you all for coming out. What thank a show. You. Thanks very much. time for the teardowns that was amazing okay thank you so much everybody for coming out uh, we just want to get all our performers up here we have a gift for everybody for being in the show and while everyone's coming up to get their gift we want to do our drawing from ready in rome this amazing travel company that's a new sponsor to morningside after dark check them out they have incredible travel itineraries and we are gonna give away a travel itinerary for up to four days. And the winner is Susan Horowitz. So go and see the Ready in Rome folks. And we just, while we're just with you, we just wanna thank you all for being the best audience. You truly are the best. And we're so grateful to you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're grateful to these performers. I mean, let's give them another round of applause. This was quite a show. Keep following Morningside After Dark on Facebook, Instagram, and our website, morningsideafterdark.com, uh, for performer gigs and upcoming um, events, possibly a summer show. We'll see. Um, we're going to get ready, too, for season 12. So we love hearing from you. We'd love to hear your ideas. Um, be sure to email us, morningsideafterdark at gmail.com. And just, just know how grateful we are to all of you. You're the reason we do this. And, of course, to be in the presence of such incredible talent that we have so much of here in the Twin Cities. So thank you so much. Such an honor to put this show on for you.